Thank you so much, Judith, and welcome again, everyone. I'm very excited and delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Carol Humden, who is the chief executive of Quorum and has been since 2007. But suffice it to say, Carol has done a lot of different things in her very interesting and varied life. In addition to a PhD in theater, she started her career working in print media enterprises before becoming the director of marketing development at the University of Westminster, and then later moving on to the British Museum in 1999 as the first director of marketing and public affairs. She has also done a stint as the uh, chair of the Autistic Society and is currently the chair of Diabetes UK. She's formerly a member of the Youth Justice Board for England and Wales and served on the Adoption Leadership Board for seven years and is a continuing member of the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. In her capacity at Quorum, she and I have had the pleasure to meet and I've been working with some of her colleagues with Quorum, which is an amazing uh, charity for children, for those of you who are less familiar with it. Without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Carol just to say that we really do welcome your questions, so don't be afraid of putting them into the chat, and we look forward to hearing this wonderful paper. Over to you, Carol. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and it's a delight to be with you, if a somewhat daunting uh, to have to marshal my thoughts uh, in such a forum. So it's going to be a privilege to have a discussion with you. I would describe this as an exploratory provocation. Um, and I'm just now going to uh, share my screen with you. And you'd think we would be good at this by now, but not necessarily. So let me just check that uh, you can, in fact, see the presentation. And you can. That's good. Uh, so I'm now just going to need to do the sorry hold on one second you see this is where we get into difficulties with all the different um menus hold on one second i think your bottom right and uh, my bottom right for shirt for share yeah. screen share oh there we are so kelly can you see that i can indeed Okay, so um, it has been my privilege to be the Chief Executive of Quorum for some considerable time since 2007. And I'm going to today use some of its um, development and examples as a spine on which to explore these questions about how our children's voice is heard. So a combination of historic and current examples um, looking at the different contexts, how children's views and experiences are seen, how children are seen or heard or acted upon in policy practice and the public discourse and whether this matters. So, as you can see, a rather expansive consideration of the context for children's voices to be heard. So, Quorum is the result of one man's vision. And this matters because Quorum is the first and longest continuing children's charity. And Thomas Quorum was an ordinary man. He was born in Lyme Regis. His mother died when he was two. He was apprenticed, uh, sorry, he was sent into the merchant fleet, um, to the merchant fleet at the age of 11 and then apprenticed as a shipwright at the age of 16. So once he had finished his apprenticeship um, and was a young man setting out in the world, he went to the then emerging United States, that is before the formation of the United States, because Thomas Coram was born in 1658. And having worked in the new world, and being dedicated and committed to trade and to the idea of the importance of trade in the emerging international world, he returned to London as a relatively old man. And he had no children. He came back with his wife, Eunice, um, and he was appalled at what he found on the streets of London, because what he found 
was the bodies of children, the bodies of infants littering the streets. And Thomas Coram's history, Thomas Coram's story within the period when he was living and working in Boston, his shipyard was in what is now the Boston Yacht Club, is that he was at odds with the prevailing social mores of the day. Whilst he was very much driven by his Anglican faith, he believed that everyone ought in duty to do any good they can. And he was a radical in the sense that he believed in uh, an, an embracing of uh, women and children, his workforce, and the opportunities that there should be for education in the service of the development of society. So when Thomas Coram came back to London, he did so at pain, uh, actually at the risk of his own life. He had been shot at, his debts were not cleared for reasons that I will uh, talk about. So whilst he is a philanthropist, do not confuse philanthropy with being the person who gives the money. He it was a champion, the first champion, really, of children's rights and welfare at a time when the concept of rights barely existed in our society. And having seen the bodies of infants littering the streets, Thomas Coram campaigned for 17 years to create what he called his Darling Project, which is the Foundling Hospital, which is the former name of this continuing charity now just named for him. And he gained a royal charter in 1739. And of course, don't be confused by the term. At the time, the word hospital meant a place of care and safety, and foundling was really a term that was used for a child who was left or discovered or found but not necessarily. So this place was the birthplace of children's social care, the first corporate parent, the first place that admitted children. So it was the place where children were seen, they were protected, and they were educated. And this story of care has inspired writers through time, from Dickens and uh, his Oliver Twist to Jack and Wilson's Hetty Feather. And I think that this is an important context to cite because we have to remember quite what the circumstance was. It is very, very easy for us uh, sitting in our society with a safety net of statutory services to forget that at the time, this was a story of squalor and destitution. So this is William Hogarth's Gin Lane, which was produced whilst he was a governor of the founding hospital in 1752. And the great portrait of Thomas Coram that you saw before was painted and given by William Hogarth in 1740. And this is an important strand in what I'm going to say. But at the moment, this is what life was like on Tottenham Court Road. Children died in vast numbers. The majority of children did not survive to their fifth birthday. And that was because of destitution and disease. Many, many women died in childbirth and there was no safety net. So if you were destitute, you could not eat. If you were a woman who gave birth to a child out of wedlock, you were destitute. There was no infrastructure, no safety net other than the workhouse. As a result of that, in the mid 17th century, children were abandoned on the streets in significant numbers and they were killed. Infanticide was uh, quite a challenge of the time. Children were quite literally neither seen nor heard and Thomas Coram saw them and was appalled that anyone should want to see this waste of life. But that was a profoundly radical position in the context where illegitimacy and the sin that it exemplified 
was seen as passing through the generations. Women had no rights. Mothers had no rights. Children were chattels of their father. Yet Coram was campaigning for girls' education and for women's inheritance. In addition, there was no innocent childhood. So you as anthropologists will know that our romantic notion, quite literally, of childhood is a very recent invention. Children worked or they died. And I just wanted to point out that children in the workforce is not a historic issue. So it was really not that long ago that working hours for children were reduced and then finally, finally removed. But it was still very late into the 20th century that there were into the 20th century that there were rules around child performers, for example, and around the world, we still see the same issues really in the manufacture of clothes and textiles. And why does this matter? Well, this matters because children were mini adults, they were in the workforce. And when you're trying to affect change in children's rights and voice, you are asking the very people, of course, men at the time, to vote for change that changes the infrastructure of their economic benefit. So the Foundling Hospital, when it was created, I would describe as a radical establishment nonconformist. So in one sense, when you're considering the question, as I know you are in your InReach series, about democratization and the issues of access to elite institutions, the Foundling Hospital was the elite institution for those who were excluded from society, period. So it only existed for that purpose, despite being supported by the English establishment, and it utilized many of the same methods for the creation of institutions that you would recognize if you were looking, for example, at the origins of Harvard, or maybe even the University of Cambridge. But certainly in relation to institutions in the kind of uh, 19th century, and Thomas Coram indeed was one of the earliest donors of books to Harvard, which is an interesting link. So we have to recognize how extraordinarily radical it was to see the children who were illegitimate in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Well, the children were admitted into the care of the founding hospital they were fostered first, because after all, there was no baby milk or formula. Uh, and then age five or four, thereabouts, they came into the residential school where they received 10 years of education at a time when there was no right to education, when the vast majority of the population was illiterate and where illegitimate children were not considered to be worthy of any support. And what is very radical is education for girls as well as boys. Education to a certain level in the support of society and in support of the mission, which was, as Thomas Coram said, to save the lives of your majesty's subjects and render them useful. So these children had a life of extraordinary support in comparison to any poor children uh, in the rest of our society. It was to some extent a model inspired by the founding hospitals of Europe, but it was a secular organization with a mission held in trust by a group of governors. And therefore, the Royal Charter was in effect the creator of what we would recognize as the modern dedicated charity. So were they were seen, but were they heard? Well, the emphasis, of course, was on knowing your place within society and not stepping out of those boundaries on discipline and service. Of course, there was no right to know 
or to be consulted or to speak up. And these are important uh, considerations. But of course, the reality of the time, I want us to imagine what it would be like to have 500 children that you were needing to feed and clothe and support uh, without any visible means of support, without any washing machines, without all kinds of the things that we might take for granted today. And within a social context where we do not have any real notions uh, of the right to speak, uh, even as an adult, uh, let alone as a woman, let alone as a child. And one of the things we find in our archive is a very interesting thing in the 1807 petition. The 1807 petition was a group of founding children who asked to know more about their mothers. So destitute women would present their children and ask for their admission to the hospital. It was a great act of love and sacrifice. As a destitute woman who could not care, the alternative was what? So therefore they would beseech and they would write in those terms to the governors to ask for the admission of their children. And because Thomas Coram absolutely radically did not judge the women uh, who had fallen into this uh, situation, as they used to say, the fallen woman, he was trying to give two new chances. He was trying to save the child and enable them to join society in a meaningful way. And he was trying to give these women, often very young, of course, the opportunity to restart their lives free of that shame. So in the history of the Foundling Hospital, there was a promise of anonymity to the mother. And every child who was admitted would have a new name and have and be baptized. Now that was partly because they didn't necessarily know the name. A child might be presented anonymously. So therefore it was a great leveler. All the children were in the same context. And this is really important in terms of their experience. They were in a peer group. They weren't singled out. They weren't labeled within the institution of which they were part, but they most certainly were within the uh, society context and where, you know, that and that fundamentally um, was important for the way in which they would live their lives. But not only did they have the support of education, but they had support throughout life. So the children upon leaving the founding hospital, which would be tenderly young by our standards, it might be 14 or 15 or 16, but they would go into apprenticeship, the services or domestic service, because those were the available work processes that would allow um, children who had come without origins, uh, without family linkages, uh, to be socially mobile in the sense of earning a living for themselves. And the Foundling Hospital was always there. They were always able to return. And they always had the peer group of the children around them. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the story of George King. So this is actually a painting of the Battle of Trafalgar. And George King, who had been admitted to the Foundling Hospital and went through this process, George King is one of the very, very few uh, Foundling former pupils who actually wrote his own story, expressed his voice. Now, George King was able to do so because of the education that he had received, which was so extraordinarily radical by the standard of the day. And that actually meant that George King went on to have um, a, a career, as we would call it, but certainly a work that after he had been uh, a soldier, a uh, sailor within the, the Battle of Trafalgar, was able to carve for himself uh, a journey into a, uh, a skilled profession because of that literacy. 
So how are we hearing the voice if you can't write or if no one is listening is a theme that comes through. And of course, in our archive, most of the children are silent except for the records that are kept about them, which speak volumes. And I just want us to remember what the alternative was, the reality of the workhouse, which uh, is a story that is told at the Vestry House Museum in Walthamstow, for example. But it was still the experience of Charlie Chaplin and his mother in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And indeed, it was Charlie Chaplin's experience of being admitted with his mother into the workhouse then in Lambeth, uh, which inspired his first full-length movie, The Kid, in 1921, which some of you will recall has the charity hospital and the mother leaving the charity hospital and leaving the child in a car in the hope of them being picked up and then the child actually being picked up by the tramp. And why do I mention these cultural references? Well, because that was an absolutely groundbreaking moment at which the experience of children, as well as the voice of those children, of course, it was silent movies, but the voice of those children was expressed in the mass media by you know, Charlie Chaplin, one of the greatest directors and one of the greatest uh, of not only his time, but probably all time with a global audience. And Oliver Twist, which had been inspired by the Foundling Hospital in part because Charles Dickens lived just round the corner. And Charles Dickens used to write for illiterate women to seek access, to seek entry into the Foundling Hospital for their children. And he wrote a very famous piece, a piece called um, Blank Child. So the blank being the space on the record for the child to details to be put in. And the we believe that he was inspired to name Mr. Brownlow in Oliver Twist after John Brownlow, who was the first pupil admitted in 1800 to become secretary of the Foundling Hospital, which he was whilst Tom Biles, Charles Dickens lived around the corner. And when Oliver Twist was filmed in 1922, the premiere of the film was given for the Foundling children in the Foundling Hospital. So right here where I am sitting. And so those children's voice was again, in a sense being expressed through this major cultural forms. So how were they seen and heard? Were they seen and heard in the Foundling Hospital itself? Well, that is a really interesting question because obviously the answer in many respects is no. We do not have loads of records of children's views of what was going on, but we have the records of what was going on and extraordinary detail. We can also see in those records an extraordinary and rather progressive commitment to play, music, culture, and what we would call careers. So what you're seeing here on the top right hand side is the boys band. So the opportunity for music making, uh, the choir within the chapel, uh, children who, Mercy Draper, who went on to be an opera singer, um, Augustus Brown, for example, who uh, was a very talented musician. And this institution was responsible for more bandsmen within the armed services than any other in the 19th century. So there was this expressive voice, this social mobility, this view, this ability to become culturally literate. Um, so in effect, you had a kind of public school for the most destitute, most uh, uh, abandoned, illegitimate children. And what you're seeing here is the um, replacement hospital, which was uh, built in the 1920s and 30s 
in order to move children from the middle of London where in the on you know there were London fogs it was a it was a literally quite toxic atmosphere in terms of their health and well-being and the governors were struggling with money so they thought they would sell some land and they built this outstanding school which is today Ashlyn School in Hertfordshire on the same design they learned to swim they went on holiday under canvas 150 years before the invention of the scouts. Now, of course, girls and boys uh, had different trajectories. The girls would be doing needlework. The boys would be doing a lot of marching. Uh, but nonetheless, they all then had access to um, careers. And one of the very important things that is within the records is this evident or evidence of the young people who went into apprenticeship or into services actually being able to write back to the hospital and either ask for help if they were being treated very badly or um, uh, yeah, to ask for help or to complain. And there's many stories about them writing and complaining about their treatment by their apprentice uh, in the apprenticeship or, and of course the reverse is true also. There was one lovely story, I think it was Augustus Brown actually, where the apprentice, he was apprenticed to a furrier and the furrier wrote and said, look, he's a nice boy, but basically he spoils all the furs. And so the governors took him back and then they placed him somewhere else. So within a lot of this, by the context of the day, there was an extraordinary amount of adaptation uh, to the, the skills and needs of the individual and disabled young people being trained, for example, blind young people being trained uh, as music, uh, as piano tuners, so that they could actually uh, have a profession uh, and others who came back into the hospital itself and were employed there. So they were seen, they weren't heard in our modern sense, but perhaps there was a more important way in which they were heard. But certainly this was decades ahead of our modern notions of things like um, school councils. And I think if we think about Tom Brown's school days, for example, of course there was physical chastisement, but not so much by the standards of the day. Um, and certainly there was an attitude that continued through many, many decades of knowing your place. But of course there came a revolution in society and the invention of the concept of the teenager. But I think we need to understand how late some of this was in coming in the 1950s and 60s. And I flag up the importance of Kathy Come Home because again, it was, um, it was the, the view um, and the presentation in the public domain of the experience of what would have been a foundling mother. So these themes of reference uh, come back within this story. It has been a very, very long march for women and children's rights. So children don't have rights unless their mothers have rights is basically the narrative that of history as far as I can see. Well, there was an age of consent to sexual relations set at 12 in 1275, but that wasn't actually extended until the late 19th century. It wasn't until 1839 and the Custody of Infants Act that mothers could even petition for custody of their children and to the age of seven and this concept therefore of the tender years. It wasn't until 1870 that there was a right to basic education. It wasn't until 1889 that there was the prevention of cruelty to and protection of children and it wasn't until 1924, there, there was the League of Nations Declaration. So this is a very, very long march indeed. 
And, you know, here, as we see, as I was explaining to you when you had Oliver Twist in 1922, this was very much the scene that would have been played out in 1739 or 1839. Um, and I wanted to draw attention to it because the little chap in the middle, whose name is Jackie Coogan, he had first appeared at the age of five as the kid in Charlie Chaplin's film of the previous year. And when Jackie Coogan um, performed in Oliver Twist, he, or rather his agent, I'm sure, um, sent a letter and a personal donation to the children of the Foundling Hospital. Now, Jackie Coogan, uh, when he came to the age of majority, he sued his own parents for his earnings, which had been had not been kept in trust for him. And that established something called Coogan's Law in 1938, which was basically the entitlement of children and child stars to have a proportion of their earnings retained in trust. So we're seeing the ways in which children's place uh, in the workforce was gradually adjusted, but how incredibly late all of this really was. So then what happened? Well, I just wanted to draw attention to 1926. And 1926 was the first point at which uh, adoption became lawful. It was also the date of the general strike, and it was the date when children marched out of the site where I still sit and where Coram still has its headquarters, leaving the, the building that had been built in 1741 to march out eventually to go to Ashland School. And that, of course, shows you um, the ways in which um, the institution was operating. But then what came? Well, what came was the People's War. Now, I cite the People's War after the book by Angus Calder, which I'm sure many of you have read, which was published in 1976, that itself being a really key year for the creation of a whole series of films reassessing Britain's post-war history by the subject of my PhD, David Hare, and another group, uh, and a group of other playwrights around him. But what Angus Calder points out in The People's War was that when rationing was introduced in this country, the diet and health of children in the country improved. So we had a great many children living on the poverty line. The other great thing, uh, of course, in the Second World War was the mass experience of evacuation. So suddenly uh, we have this cumulative understanding in society about the issues of alternative care and separation and loss with modern notions of attachment theory being well later in their development. But in our story, an important moment, perhaps, for a recalibration in society on the views and experiences and voices of children. Now, I wanted to draw your attention to this because in 1947, the, there was the formation of the Old Quorum Association, which was really the first formal voice, albeit of the former pupils as they were coming up to leave, the creation of an alumni association. And um, in third from the left is Edward Newton. And I met Edward when he was 102 years old. And Edward had been admitted into the Foundling Hospital in March 1915 in the ways that may have been identical from, as I say, maybe 1815, with the same uniforms and what would appear to be much of the same structure. Edward told me uh, of uh, the support that he received, the fact that in the Foundling Hospital at the time he was watching movies 
Uh, he didn't mention Oliver Twist, but he did sing me the song from uh, the movie that he first saw, which is a musical about cowboys. And Edward went on to have lifelong friendships and never felt the need to return. He did return eventually at our request in order to meet the Queen as the oldest living former pupil in 2018. And he spoke to her about meeting her, great, her grandfather, George V, when he visited. So Edward's voice was seen, heard in one sense through time. But on the right, on the left here is John Caldicott, who is the second pupil to become a governor of this organization, then succeeded by Ruth on the right hand side, who is still a serving governor of this organization. And in the middle is the redoubtable Lydia. And Lydia served as secretary of the old quorum association. She was at the first meeting. She's now 90 and she retired last year. Some of these stories that I am conveying to you are the result of the quorum four year program to digitize our historic archive, the longest continuing archive of care in order to amplify the voices of children through time. We've had 2,000, I think it's now 4,000 volunteers transcribing these records. And the key thing is that the program is enabling young people in care today to rediscover, to explore, reclaim their heritage, to tell their stories and to influence, inform and change the future of care. So I urge you all to watch No Place Like Home, which is a 30 minute film that does just that, which is available on our website. What were the critical junctures? Why is the Foundling Hospital not still happening? Well, it's not still happening because of that people's war, because of that change in social attitudes of government and society in the period of the Second World War. And that led to the Curtis Report and finally the commitment of this country to deinstitutionalization. And so the 1948 Education Act, uh, Children Act, I apologize, set up for the first time the responsibilities formally on uh, children's services, on statutory services, in order to care for um, children. And so this is, again, incredibly late. So where was the voice of the child in all of that? So looking at this long march, what happened then? Well, there was the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child, did much change. As I was explaining, there was the uh, the changes further in social attitude then through the 60s and the 70s with a great liberalization, uh, the advent of contraception, which led to a massive reduction in the number of children born illegitimately. Um, and in 1975, a remarkable social worker called Gwen James proposed the creation of a voice of the child in care. So championing the notion of the child's voice. The first advocacy case supporting a seven-year-old was in 1977. That organization is now part of the Quorum Group and it is called Quorum Voice. In the 1979 was the International Year of the Child and, and what was then Voice of the Child in Care uh, launched a Voice in Their Lives campaign. So you started to get the campaigning uh, drive um, of not, uh, not about us without us in, in one sense, which is uh, much more driven by uh, young people uh, with their own lived experience. In 1981, the Children's Legal Centre, which is today the Quorum Children's Legal Centre, was created as the UK's response to the International Year of the Child, which of course identified that all around the world, children were starving, in poverty, destitute, abandoned, bombed, wounded, abused, and without access to education. 
And that was a full eight years before the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which recalibrated our social response to um, children's voice. But I just wanted to point out uh, how much more work there was and remains to do. The special representative on the sale and sexual exploitation of children in 1970, on children and armed conflict in 1996, a special representative on violence uh, against children, um, and in 2004, the creation of the Office of the Children's Commissioner in the UK, which uh, under parliamentary supervision uh, is designed to hold to account. And this is the remarkable first Children's Commissioner, Professor Sir Al Ainsley Green. Why do I flag him up? I mean, you'll all be familiar with the excellent work that Rachel D'Souza is doing uh, now as the fourth children's commissioner. But Al was groundbreaking because Al put the voice of children central to that mission. He was also the first uh, president of the British Medical Association who was a pediatrician. And he had spent his career in child's health in the Northeast. But if you read his book, which is passionately entitled the British Betrayal of Childhood, you will find that Thomas Coram was his inspiration. So 1989, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, lots and lots and lots of provisions. And this is the most ratified convention of any conventions. Except for one country, and we'll leave you to guess for the um, discussion, which one that is. So this is important because Article 12 of the UN Convention enshrines that every child has the right to be heard and that their views should be taken seriously. That doesn't, of course, mean that they should be necessarily important. No, they should be important, but doesn't mean that they should be paramount. Indeed, under the 1989 Children Act, which is the most definitive change. It is a very important principle, the paramountcy principle, which is that the welfare of the child must be paramount. Now that is really important because children's timescales don't match adults' timescales. Children's interests are not necessarily those of their parent or family. And why is this important for another very fundamental reason? Kids feel important when you involve them in stuff about their life. So the 1989 Children Act then led to a revolution in practice, or did it? So it led to a sector of response. So several charities um, and organizations with an, an up waiting certainly uh, within all of that on hearing the voice of children and their experiences. And observational listening, this uh, quorum pioneered the listening to young children toolkit, which has now find its way into several, several editions. There's much greater development of consumer insight, so that understanding uh, perhaps as children as consumers. The big ask survey uh, by the Children's Commissioner last year uh, received 500,000 responses. Um, and, I, and, and what you find within that is that the things that matter to children are remarkably consistent in relation to a feeling of safety, a feeling of agency, access to education, support of friends and family. And we have to ask ourselves, not are we listening through time to what is important, even when it is inconvenient to us. And I'm just going to now delve into the work that Quorum does in relation to the Bright Spots survey. So since the development of the Bright Spots initiative with the University of Bristol, then the Recenter and supported by the uh, Hadley Trust, um, Quorum has co-produced with children and young people uh, a range of subjective well-being measures and has set about exploring the question of what makes life good for children and young people. 
So the narrative of care is written like this, which is the outcomes of care are terrible. Only X percent go to university. Yes, and that is true. But actually, what is important to the children and young people themselves? How well fit would you be to undertake your GCSEs if you'd had five placement moves, five different schools, and you spent your life terrified? So if you've experienced emotional trauma, why, why is this language, why is this agenda being driven by our outcome measurement when we need to think about the children's subjective well-being? And within the uh, Bright Spot surveys, I remind you, this is a cumulative uh, survey with remarkably consistent results and extraordinarily high levels of response up to um, 65%, which is an extraordinary uh, concentration of the experiences of young people in and leaving care. The vast majority of children consistently say that their life in care is significantly better. They say that they have, I'm pleased to say, the vast majority say they have an adult in their lives uh, who is interested in their learning and on whom they can depend, which is 25 percentage points better than the general population. The children who do worst within the care system are those who enter later, those who have multiple moves, uh, and those who have multiple changes of um, professional who are supporting them, broadly speaking. And this survey programme is also the only one that actually um, surveys children aged under seven. Because the other thing that of course occurs within our concerns to hear the voice of children is that actually we talk to people who were once children, but closer to once having been children than we are. But actually, the if you're looking at the care population, you are, as you always were, most likely to enter care as an infant. And then there is a second peak of, of admission to uh, or needing protection uh, in your teenage years. So it's really important that we are thinking about this, how uh, experiences are captured, how voice is heard, uh, not just through methods that are more convenient to us. And does it matter? What is happening as a result? Well, it really, really does matter. Um, having a voice improves your sense of well-being, but actually all too many. So you can see here feedback from the Bright Scores. So social workers can do it, foster carers can do it, but sometimes they don't do it. But the odds of having very high well-being increased by one and a half times if young people felt included in decision making compared to those who did not feel involved. So at the level of the individual, as we all know from our own lives, that developmental age appropriate agency and opinion um, uh, and sense of control over the future is really important to our individual well-being. But if we think about uh, how well is this going generally, what, what is the experience that we also need to hear from? Well, we know that it is still the case that a teenager says, I have no control. I have no sense of agency. Uh, a continuing story of stigma of care kids. Mechanisms like entering the classroom and saying, come out now, your social worker's here. Having a register that has black written on it. Uh, we've had an excellent independent review conducted by Josh McAllister, brackets, again. So um, there's some excellent work within that. Indeed, the Young People of a National Voice, which was a care leaver-led organization now part of the Quorum Group, uh, which is the National Children in Care Council, was commissioned by the independent review to hear 
the voice of children and young people. So that has to be a really important milestone into our public policy making. But we are still talking to people um, in power, if you like, in authority, as we were uh, at the time when employment legislation was looking to be changed, who have interests which are other and which are different. So one of the ways in which you can see that in action <clears throat> is that only one third of young people who present to local authorities as homeless even get the assessment to which they are entitled. And in our society today, we have 215,000 estimated undocumented children. That leaves them potentially stateless. So how are we doing? So within the quorum group, who do we prioritize? Well, let's think about this, or let's think about it from a quorum point of view for the moment. You, you would be able to look much more widely. But children whose lives are subject to the decisions of the courts, how well do the courts wait or hear the views and voices of children and young people? Well, not very well. Indeed, a few years ago, we had a major project, um, which was across nine countries uh, across Europe, and the UK was chosen because it was really not very good at it. And I ask you, how, are the, how is the infant voice heard in care proceedings? So children and young people who depend on the support of the state who are in or leaving care, needing adoption or alternative family placement, um, it takes exceptional and important effort to ensure that their voice is, not, is heard and weighted within the decisions that are made. Mm. How likely is that? How is that playing out for unaccompanied, migrant, refugee, trafficked, homeless, or otherwise marginalized young people? So as we have discussed, should a child really in our society ever be without recourse to public funds, without independent legal advice to exercise their rights? Should they in fact ever be deported because of the uh, position of their family? Or let me give you an example from one of my advocates who I bumped into coming into the office and I said, how are you? She said, I've just come from a family in London living in one room uh, without recourse to public funds with two adults and two children, living in one room, uh, sharing a bathroom with 36 other people. The child needs an operation and the hospital will not conduct it because the circumstances in which they live are too insanitary. Children with experience of trauma, neglect, separation, discrimination, or exploitation. How well are we doing at hearing uh, their voice or addressing their voice in balance with their welfare? How many children are actually being um, denied liberty under deprivation of liberty, which is by the back door in relation to a failure of health provision? And how are we hearing the voice of children at risk of educational disadvantage who have been or are at risk of exclusion? So this is where there is, for me, a very significant crossover to um, autism. You are five times more likely to be permanently excluded from school if you are autistic. You may be nonverbal. You may struggle with social interaction. Um, and the Quorum Children's Legal Center spends much of the time of its education department actually um, bringing litigation for the non-fulfillment of education, health and care plans. So here are the, my lovely young citizens. So Quorum has pioneered the development of the National Children in Care Council this is the pioneering group of young citizens with experience of the immigration system, uh, which was the first pioneering national group of that. And we also had the adoptables, which was to hear the voice of adopted young people because they are very often overlooked within our discourse. Are we really 
fully embracing equality, diversity, and inclusion, we all know that there is a significant overrepresentation for children from diverse backgrounds and how well are their voices being heard, but not only how well are they being heard, because there is report after report after report after report through these decades. Um, there was the very important uh, movement, the care experience movement, uh, the, a groundbreaking report, Blackening Care. These trends through decades are being exacerbated, concentrated and reinforced uh, by increase in poverty and also by further recently uh, by COVID. Sometimes also, it is a cultural intervention that actually might tip the dial of public understanding. So given that my own son is autistic uh, with learning difficulties, type two diabetes, epilepsy, unexplained fits, lives on in two to one support and spent two years denied an education, I would say that one of the most important things to happen was the publication of the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And of course, for the National Autistic Society in particular, the championship of the views and experiences, not only of the child, but of the family um, that is caring for them had its origins only in 1962, where pretty much you could summarize it that a group of parents were told their children were uh, ineducable and psychotic and it was their fault. And the National Autistic Society has been at the forefront of pioneering diagnostic assessments, um, but also uh, social understanding and exclusion, uh, it, it, understanding to tackle exclusion, including through the groundbreaking too much information campaign. So is all the world a stage um, actually, and who are the players upon it? Well, this is uh, Coram Shakespeare Schools Festival, which is the largest youth drama festival in the world. Um, and I ask you the question of, are children still getting play, music, culture, and careers, and these opportunities? They feel narrow, despite the fact that the world has never been a bigger stage. And this is perhaps the generation generational challenge for us all that the world is indeed a stage, but it is a stage in which children live their lives in public. And just like the story of Jackie Coogan, we need to ask ourselves what the consequences are for children and how we prepare them and help them to navigate the world in which they will live. This is Kirsty, who is the winner or one of the winners recently of the Quorum Voices um, competition, which is specifically for children in and leaving care. So we know that outcomes for individuals are better if they feel they are heard and they are genuinely heard, that choice and agency in life is part of growing up, that not, without, not about us without us should always be our mantra. But it is not a case for adultification and expecting children to have opinions or to um, make decisions outside of the um, child development journey. You can't say that someone has consent because it's more convenient to you to say that they can consent. Services may or may not have better outcomes from being co-produced. And it is convenient to hear only those who speak. Uh, as I say, the sort of professionalization of the voice um, or to act only in adults' interests. Um, children need stability. That's quite inconvenient to the adult world and professionals. And we really can't avoid difficult issues by saying we're concerned not to stigmatize and therefore we don't talk about it. So at the moment, I would say this is a major issue in relation to uh, the early onset of obesity. So a very significant proportion of children are now living with excess weight. And we know that uh, this will increase their chances of diabetes, of type two diabetes by up to 90%.
So we really do have to find new ways to explore these issues without stigmatizing, but not, not address them because we might stigmatize. But generally this generation of children has the biggest platform in history to be heard because of the social media platform. But still children's rights are not implemented. There is structural economic and social inequality. We're not listening. The vast majority of young people did not want Brexit. They live in a social media world and they are bothered by the environment. So the journey continues. We must legislate, we must do much more. I just wanted to flag up this team here, which is the team in the Quorum Children's Legal Center, bringing strategic litigation, working with 29 countries. And in the center there, Professor Dame Carolyn Hamilton, who as far as we know, is the only person ever to receive such an honor for children's rights. And finally, let's be optimistic. Children are in the smallest minority of the British population in history. That is a huge risk to them. But when the world is silent, even one voice can be powerful. Thank you so much, Carol. That was brilliant um, and very thought provoking.